West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com This committee and their own anti-police rhetoric. This is a defund the FBI campaign effort. That was quite entertaining from someone that had a sexual relationship with a Chinese spy, and everyone knows it. But I move to take our words down. Completely inappropriate. Yes, yeah, stand by just a second while we research the rule. Um, give me just a second. The chair uh, recognizes the gentlelady from Georgia and asks if she would like to retract those words. No, I will not. Complete outrage where China is poisoning America's children, poisoning our teenagers, poisoning our young people. How long are you going to let this go on? Congresswoman, let me assure you that we're not letting it go on. We are fighting this. Scourge. No, I reclaim my time. You're a liar. You are letting this go on in the numbers. Well, no. actually, I want you to take the words of the speaker down. So in uh, making a ruling on this, uh, it's pretty clear that the rules state you can't impugn someone's uh, character. Uh, identifying or calling someone a liar is unacceptable in this committee. And I make the ruling that we strike those words. It's, uh, sorry, just a point of order. It's a legitimate question. You're recognized. Are, are, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Did you move to take the words down or to strike them, Mr. Thompson? Yeah, sorry, I just stepped in. Point yeah, of order. Uh, take them down. So, what would you? Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. My understanding is if words are taken down, that means that the the member can no longer speak in whatever the proceeding is that those words were said. Personal inquiry. Point of personal inquiry. That's there's no, no such Stand thing. Stand by just a second. House, uh, when we strike, uh, it does terminate the time of the individual who is speaking. So uh, the gentlelady is no longer recognized. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Ivy, I believe. Uh, can I make a point of inquiry, Mr. Chairman? You can. So the the ruling was that because she used the word liar, um, that was taken down, which I agree with. Yes. But but accusing a this, statement of fact is very similar to the posters that uh, Mr. There's uh, no statement of fact. There's no statement of bullshit. Fact. There's no there's, there's no, no factual fact. basis for the statement. We're not here to debate this, okay? And the ruling was made by the chair. That these previous words were not against the rules of uh, Clause 1 and Clause 4 of Rule 17. But to tell someone that they are a liar is, it, it's pretty clear in the rules. Slander is clearly covered by the rules. Tell you what, I hope it's okay that Marjorie Taylor Greene only has a few seconds of fodder for Hannity's show tonight. I know it's not the usual five full minutes that he was relying on, but hopefully those small sound bites will be enough to please the right-wing media ecosystem that she's performing for.
Now, just imagine for a moment if Marjorie Taylor Greene and these other MAGA extremists were actually smart enough to know the rules of the body that they're currently serving in. There is a reason that Trump's crimes were called Stupid Watergate, and Marjorie Taylor Greene is doing her part to make sure that moniker still sticks. Now, let's think for a moment about why Republicans like Greene are so hellbent on focusing on fentanyl. And it's pretty obvious. They've used fentanyl as a proxy to surface their favorite issue, the border. And they've been doing this for years. There were at least another 100,000 people who got away into this country. Those are the ones that are bringing the drugs over, that are smuggling people over, that are bringing terrorists in, that have a criminal record. We don't know what those criminal records are. They may be murdered. What President Biden has done with his border, opening up, now we're catching people on the terrorist watch list. Fentanyl has increased by 300%, killing Americans as we come across. Under the Biden administration, we have had the most uh, gotaways at our southern border in the history of ever. And under the Biden administration, we've had the most fentanyl coming into our country in the history, history of ever. But even according to the Cato Institute, which is one of the country's leading right-wing think tanks, the ones smuggling fentanyl into the U.S. aren't asylum seekers, they're not immigrants, they are Americans. In fact, the market for fentanyl is composed of 99% U.S. citizens, and in 2021, nearly 9 in 10 people convicted of trafficking fentanyl were U.S. citizens. Here's a chart of fentanyl traffickers from 2018 to 2021 proving that it is U.S. citizens who are responsible for moving these drugs. And remember the Trump administration's decision to shut down the border? And remember how the entire right cheered it on? Turns out that when the border was closed, that exacerbated the transition to American fentanyl abuse because fentanyl is the easiest to conceal drug. Seizures tripled from 30% of combined heroin and fentanyl seizures to over 90%, while annual deaths doubled from 2019 to 2021. Here's a statement from the Cato Institute, which, again, is a leading right-wing think tank. It is monstrous that tens of thousands of people are dying unnecessarily every year from fentanyl. Reducing deaths require figuring out the cause, not jumping to blame a group that is not responsible. Instead of attacking immigrants, policymakers should focus on effective solutions that help people at risk of a fentanyl overdose. But do any of those facts matter to Republicans? Not at all, because their goal isn't to actually solve any of these problems, it's to have a talking point to constantly batter Democrats with. If they did want to solve it, they'd have passed immigration reform when they had full control of government from 2017 to 2019. But instead, they just gave themselves a tax cut and left the issue of immigration untouched because they know that it's more useful to them as a problem than it is being solved. They're not in the business of fixing things, they're in the business of keeping problems top of mind and exploiting your never-ending rage about it. Consider too, if Republicans, like Green, were serious about protecting Americans, you would think they wouldn't be so quick to cast aside the number one cause of death for young people, and that is gun deaths. And yet, not a word about tackling gun violence. Still, they'll claim that in order to reduce gun violence, we need more guns. Now, of course, we all know that's bullshit. We have the benefit of being able to challenge that strategy by comparing our laws to the laws in every other country in the planet, where guns are less readily available and there are few, if any, mass shootings. It's almost like there's a correlation between the number of guns and the number of mass shootings. Who would have guessed? But again, this has nothing to do with protecting people and everything to do with these politicians protecting themselves and their donors. They'll pretend to be offended about fentanyl despite not only having passed zero comprehensive immigration reform when they had the majority, but actually exacerbating the problem by shutting down the border which immediately led to a surge in fentanyl smugglings. And yet, at the same time, when there is a problem that's actually more deadly when it comes to America's young people, you get responses like this one. Three precious little kids lost their lives, and I believe three adults, I believe it's, and, um, and the shooter, of course, lost their life, too. So it's, it's a horrible, horrible situation, and we're not going to fix it. Criminals are going to be criminals, and my daddy fought in the Second World War, fought in the Pacific, fought the Japanese, and he told me, he said, buddy, he said, if somebody wants to take you out and doesn't mind losing their life, there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do about it. Pretty amazing to see a legislator, whose job it is to legislate, decide that nothing can be done to solve a problem that could quite literally be solved with legislation. It's almost like these people aren't acting in good faith. And that was a point that Jamie Raskin very clearly seized upon in a recent interview. You know, he speaks the party line there, which is when gun violence happens, their, um, their go-to motto is, oh, this was evil, this is moral evil, there's evil in the world. Suddenly, they're all like cloistered theologians just pronouncing upon evil in the world, as opposed to elected officials who are sent to Congress in order to get something done, but they just throw up their hands and say, well, oh yes, the, you know, three more school children were assassinated in school, there's evil in the world, c'est la vie, what more can be done? I mean, it's obscene. and. 
future generations will look back on this as a period where an entire political party basically adopted an implicit policy of mass sacrifice because they're basically saying we're going to sacrifice all of these innocent people who are being mowed down in massacres and just the daily toll of gun violence to our vision of the second amendment which is a completely twisted and distorted view of the second amendment so look i want to be clear none of this is to say that the issue of fentanyl isn't important because it absolutely is but republicans are not here to offer legitimate solutions they are here to exploit this tragedy for their own political benefit again the past few actions that they have taken actually exacerbated the problem and that's coming from a right-wing think tank not me if the gop has shown us anything it's that they are not capable of solving problems but they'll be happy to wail about them if they think it'll help them at the ballot box Remember, Republicans came into the cycle pretending they would do something to tackle inflation and gas prices. Remember that? If you can name one single action they've taken to do that, I'd love to hear it, because you and I both know that the answer is nothing. The fact is that they've already shown us who they are and what they're willing to do. They'll sit in their hearings and execute gotcha moments for their five minute cable hit on Fox, but that's all. They're not here to help you or me or anyone in this country. They're here to help themselves and their brands. And they've proven it time and time again. When someone shows you who they are, believe them. It is Thursday, the 20th of April of 2023. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef, and our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, a little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. Oh, indeed. Uh, Just a reminder, the recipe for my Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, that's why the Metro part has been added, because, I, you know, like all recipes, you, you take some from here, some from there, and then you add your own little flair. <laughs> Is that what you do? Anyway, the recipe that I had put together and put out at a production rate, by the way, when you're in the cooking wars, it's all about production. Get it out. Get it on the plate. Get it out. Anyway, the recipe for that can be found at the uh, show notes and links diary at Daily Co. So go to the appropriate social media platforms and uh, you'll find your way to the Daily Co's links. Okay, how are you? It being 420, I thought I would play a little joke as we hand off uh, from the overnight feed to uh, to David's show in the morning. And uh, I was using an old uh, Cheech and Chong routine about, uh, hey, you know, guy knocks on the door, hey, it's Dave. And the stone guy inside goes, Dave's not here, man. <laughs> And of course, I don't know. I use that and, and and you would think that maybe a guy by the name of David might think that he's not connected to the stream and there's something going wrong. It looks like everything's working, but Dave's not here, man. Well, it is 420, so I guess maybe the joke did work, except it wasn't ha-ha. <laughs> it's supposed to work with a ha Sorry, David. Anyway, Dave, Dave was here and he was just knocking on the door and the, you know, the stone guy inside goes, Hey, Dave's not here, man. I'm still waiting for him though. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So, um, now there is some dispute about the origin of 420 arising from the, what, half dozen students at San Rafael high school back in 1971. I was a sophomore then. Yeah. 15. Yep. But that was in the Orange County, and uh, we were already up and beyond into, shall we say, harder substances by that time. Because it was 1971, and we were at the tail end of all that fun. So they say. Anyway, there was some dispute about the actual origin story, and um, I don't know. I still like the idea that some guys, you know, sat around, made up something, and the next thing you know, it's morphed into uh, what some might call a national holiday. And we have a specific sacrament or Eucharist, some might claim, (laughs) that, that we share amongst ourselves. Yes, indeed. But don't bogart it, man. Yeah. 
or as I learned during that time, you know, what we sometimes call back in the day, uh, uh, a guy once told me that sharing is better than taking. So rather than him coming over and just taking my stuff, I do, I, I'm just sharing it with him. And I thought, you know, well, that does seem like a community, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Maybe a community. You better leave before you share all your stuff away. <laughs> anyway, what are possessions anyway? But traps, chains, tying you down to a world of discontent. Let them go. <laughs> Next thing you know, they're starting religions and uh, they're off and running. Maybe that's how Joel Olstein got to start. You never know. Promise them everything and tell them, but you got to give me something and I'll give it back. Oh, yeah. See that sunshine? God is shining upon you. Hey, <laughs> now that's paying with interest. See ya. All right. Okay. What a wacko world we live in uh, where religion is such a, I don't know, paramount part of our existence now. To the point that every wacko, I don't know, belief system out there can say, I, I, I don't like a particular thing, and so therefore uh, no one else can either. <clears throat> I swear to God, we're going to get to the point where there's going to be some wacko judge who says, measles vaccines are a plot against us uh, by George Soros. Yes, yes, that guy. Our Goldstein, our great fear, and uh, then no one can have a uh, be, be vaccinated against measles, mumps, and rubella because of mercury film on the inside of the test tubes. I, it's whatever wacko thing. People's teeth are going to be falling out because they're not only going to keep from. Fluoride being added to water systems in those areas where they discovered that fluoride, um, the people that lived in those aquifers that had some fluoride in their water system tended to not have uh, bad teeth. That's the whole idea about adding fluoride. They're going to take the fluoride out. Because some woke scientists said that that was what was happening. Yeah, woke science. Sounds like Jewish science, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what the Nazis called uh, whatever they didn't like that happened to have anything to do with the Jewish uh, people. That's Jewish science. You know, just basic uh, common sense type things and notions that people have been living with because of science. But because it didn't uh, adhere to whatever control instinct the Nazis had over their subjects. That's Jewish science. Got to get rid of it. Put a star of David on it. Yep. And then Einstein came here. Boy, that's jumping from the fire into the frying pan, huh? Ouch. Okay. And I also said way back in the day, way back... That, um, I don't know, letting a bunch of former Nazis uh, start our own intelligence apparatus here. What could go wrong? What? Yeah. Next thing you know, you can't teach the history of America in the schools. That's going to make someone upset. That's going to make some little Nazi kid upset. Jesus Christ. So much for academic freedom, which is supposed to be a cornerstone of a representative democracy. Supposed to be. But they don't want a representative democracy. They want something called a constitutional republic. Not knowing that we are both. But we're a representative democracy above all. So there you go. It's a hybrid that's why we are called the Great Experiment. So now I guess they're experimenting with really caustic, acidic uh, substances to see if we can withstand it. And I'm like thinking that, hey, wait, 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 wait. Let's not destroy this to see if it works. Okay, please. <laughs> you don't have to do that. 
Ah, but who listens to us, huh? Well, I'll tell you who listens to us. Apparently, if you squeak that wheel enough, results will occur. So, uh, would we uh, be discussing any of this if we hadn't squeaked the wheel? Would uh, the Tennessee Three be reinstated if the wheel had remained unsqueaked? No, we wield great power. We stopped a war. Well, I mean, kinda. (laughs) But we did. Brought the boys home. Uh, Which is another pet peeve of me. Show me one picture of all the history of uh, Vietnam where there's a hippie spitting on a Vietnam soldier or vet. Give me a break. Everybody says, oh, yeah, I got spit on by anti-war hippies. No, you didn't. Man, they got pictures of, like, kisses. They got pictures of picking up little kids on the tarmac. I mean, in the whole history of all of photojournalism, in all of just people taking, like, random uh, family shots, and there's, like, people uh, right, right over the shoulder, you know, soldiers coming by, Where is a spit? Can't find it. Because I maintain it never happened. It was made up and it got out of hand because it's a trope that people will believe that they believe it so much they believe it happened to them too. What I remember is that if anybody was spitting on them figuratively, it was... The establishment, because they looked at our boys as losing the war. No ticker tape parade for them. That wasn't perpetrated by liberal hippies. That was perpetrated by the establishment. The squares. The brown shoes. Give me a break. Any kind of help that was afforded to those GIs when they came back was because we, hippie, anti-war activists, squeaked the wheel so that those guys could have some help. So they could get housing, so they could get education, so that they could have mental health counseling because of the tragedy and trauma they had to endure. Who fought against that? The establishment. The only people spitting on our GIs from Vietnam was the establishment. But somehow, it was the Antifa hippies of the day. That is gaslighting. And when I hear arguments that brainwashing doesn't work, I'm thinking, well, what the hell is Madison Avenue and the whole idea of our advertising industry about if it isn't about brainwashing? I need this because I need it. Give me a break. Economic bubbles of worldwide calamity over pet rocks. I mean, what is brainwashing? That's exactly what it is. And so we've commodified our information streams. And what makes money? Apparently brainwashing. Right-wing brainwashing. The brainwashing, apparently, the grooming of empathy, care for our fellow human beings, uh, being neighborly, helpful, dutiful, and kind does not sell. Well, how many times have you heard me rant about that? Lots. So I guess, you know what, instead of doing that, because we are going through some time, and we have a bit of a we have a bit of some news here to uh, to endure. <laughs> yes, we do. So do I, why don't we get into it? And at the top, yes, that was Marjorie Taylor Greene's latest stunt for Fox backfired. Yeah, instantly and blew up on her face. Now, if they could just like get her off all the committees and out of government. That would be perfectly fine because you would expect. You would expect a cabal of anti-American, anti-democratic, representative democracy, uh, insurgent Nazis 
who took part in a violent insurrection to overthrow the United States of America, if they heard that the full faith and credit of the United States would come into question and we may uh, collapse as an empire (laughs) or as a country, as a nation, because uh, we didn't pay our bills, do you think that they care? They want us destroyed. And if they, we could be destroyed by defaulting on the debt ceiling, what incentive do they have to help us, you know, pay our bills? So I'd be perfectly happy to have her removed in some fashion. And it looks like uh, maybe some of the GOP are thinking uh, she's been, I don't know, throwing the pipe bombs a little bit too much. We can only hope on the rest of the menu in the Bistro Cafe. The first officer has been disciplined nearly two years after the Los Angeles Police Department bomb squad blew up a South L.A. neighborhood by detonating a cache of fireworks. Kaboom! Portland, Oregon police responded to LGBTQ plus training With the expected racist, transphobic, homophobic, misogynistic feedback. You you name it, it was there. And a semi-automatic rifle ban passed the Washington State Legislature. After the break, we move to the chef's table where scientists have identified the cause of a massive Caribbean sea urchin die-off. And Russia is expected of spying in the waters of the Baltic and North Seas using civilian fishing trawlers, cargo ships, and yachts. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln, who is making big plans for uh, Netroots Nation in Chicago this year. So uh, hopefully folks will tune in if you're not actually going to visit Chicago for Netroots Nation. If you are, uh, check us out. You'll see our banner prominently displayed wherever we get to display it. I don't know what they're doing with uh, Media Radio Row this year, but uh, we'll have a presence there once again, as we have uh, for pretty much every single one, except for when it was yearly cos. A little bit before our time, before we got up and uh, on our feet and running. (laughs) But thank you, Kelly, for everything that you do. If you would look across from uh, to the left uh, from that uh, chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, there is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio and possibly send us what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink, for instance, how about that? If you could afford to send those funds to us once a month, it really does help us offset the ever-increasing costs of running this powerhouse of resistance. And uh, it's, one might say, a labor of love, but we might also consider it a labor of duty. Uh, And we have the gallows humors going, huh? So thank you for uh, letting us fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended so many, many, many years ago. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Mastodon, and Spoutable, do so, please, at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. And a lot more. Thanks, Tom. Also, you could follow me on Twitter, Mastodon, and Spoutable, at Justice Putnam, of course. I post those show notes and links, diaries, on Daily Co's. I know they want to call them stories. They're diaries. Uh, the show notes and links diary is posted... Uh, at some point, it used to be 10 minutes before, but 
I don't know. The They say shit happens, and it does. So I at least get those links available to you for the particular show when I get the podcast ready for going. And then I post a podcast diary to let folks know, hey, there's one available here, and you can listen to it on the Spreaker player if you'd like. And uh, you can get the show notes and links there. But generally, just going to any of my social media feeds, you'll be able to go to the list of uh, of everything, including the Justice Department Music Sans Frontier. For those of you who need uh, a little bit of soothing vibes to recharge the batteries and get you back out there and be activated and ch- keep the world from becoming a Nazi hellhole. Oh, my God. But anyway, you can follow me at Justice Putnam for all of that. Now, you can also follow the show on Twitter, such as it is. I do promise that I will uh, pay more attention to the <laughs> to the uh, show social media feeds. But you can find uh, the show and follow it at Cookbook West on Twitter. I'm not quite on the other ones yet because, well, I have to... Log out and log in, and I'm going to figure out a way to do that more quickly so it's easier on the eyes and hands. That's how we'll put it. Okay. And most importantly, if you would please uh, pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. We like that, too, because we put out those podcasts. All right. Got all those particulars out of the way. We've been kind of ignoring them for a while, but I had to do it. I just had to. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the L.A. Times by Libor Janey. Nearly two years after the Los Angeles Police Department bomb squad blew up a South Los Angeles neighborhood during the detonation of a cache of fireworks, Officials say the first officer involved has been disciplined. The unnamed cop was suspended for 10 days without pay for being what the department calls deficient in duties, which contributed to an excessive quantity of a, of explosive material being loaded into and detonated in the total containment vessel. According to department records posted online, the officer was only identified by rank and assignment. Police Officer 3 from Technical Service Maintenance. No other details were provided. Uh, Part of the reason why this is a news story is because the LAPD thought, hey, let's go into this predominantly uh, black neighborhood and blow up a bunch of illegal fireworks that we confiscated to show them who's boss. Nice, huh? Now, the disciplinary action is the first to come to light against an officer in the widely criticized June 2021 incident as the city continues to work with the dozens of residents and businesses affected by the blast. In an interview on Tuesday... LAPD Chief Michael Moore said he could not discuss the particular officer's case, citing employee privacy laws. Oh, really? But he said a lengthy investigation found sufficient evidence that misconduct occurred during the botched explosion. This led him to recommend discipline against a number of officers that were Involved in the handling and process and decision-making, Moore said. Yeah, what the hell were they going into a populated neighborhood with a bunch of businesses and blowing up a bunch of fireworks they had no actual ability to contain? He did not know offhand how many officers were ultimately disciplined in connection with the explosion, which means he does. An LAPD spokeswoman later clarified that six department employees and all were accused of misconduct in connection in the incident. Captain Kelly Muni said two officers were disciplined for their roles and corrective action. Direct department parlance for extra training were assigned and was assigned to two others. Details of the other disciplinary case had not been made public as of Tuesday. 
Under the LAPD's current discipline system, officers facing suspension or even termination for misconduct can have their cases heard before a closed-door tribunal known as the Board of Rights. Disciplinary decisions are not generally announced until their final disposition. On June 30th of 2021, the police department's bomb squad botched the detonation of a large fireworks cache discovered in the backyard of a home on 27th Street in South Los Angeles. The resulting blast ripped through the densely populated neighborhood, injuring 17 people and destroying dozens of homes, cars, and businesses. And more than 80 residents were displaced. Dean Bernstein of the Oregonian brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. Unidentified Portland police officers left derogatory remarks on an anonymous survey seeking their feedback about online training regarding how to refer to and interact with people in the LGBTQ plus community. The statements revealed racism, ableism, and white supremacy and the need for more better equity instruction, according to city-hired consultants. The Bureau's Equity and, and Inclusion Office, which works out of the police chief's office, developed the training last year. Dennis Rosenbaum of Rosenbaum & Associates, the firm monitoring the police bureau's compliance with a federal settlement agreement, said the chief's office was alerted about the problem during the second quarter of 2022. Staff in the chief's office and city officials promised to address the problematic ideologies expressed in the surveys, but the consultants said in their latest report that they had yet to see a response. Rosenbaum said the police chief and city leaders must emphasize that such ideologies have no place within the Bureau while not infringing on any member's First Amendment rights. These attitudes and perspectives can come to bear on how Portland Police Bureau members treat members of the Portland community as well as their fellow officers, the consultants wrote. A police spokesperson said Cheek Chief Chuck Lovell did not overtly address the survey remarks because he wants to foster candid feedback on training and believes the new LGBTQ plus directive will do the work intended. The anonymous statements came in the wake of ongoing distrust between members of the LGBTQ community and law enforcement. None of this surprises me, said Deborah Porta executive director of Pride Northwest. Lisa Bowman of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. 
A ban on dozens of semi-automatic rifles cleared the Washington state legislature yesterday, Wednesday, and the governor is expected to sign it into law. The high-powered firearms, once banned nationwide, are now the weapon of choice among young men responsible for most of the country's devastating mass shootings. The ban comes after multiple failed attempts in the state legislature and amid the most Mass shootings during the first 100 days of a calendar year since 2009. The Washington law would block the sale, distribution, manufacture, and importation of more than 50 gun models, including AR-15s, AK-47s, and similar style rifles. Those guns fire one bullet per trigger pull and automatically reload for a subsequent shot. Some exemptions are included for sales to law enforcement agencies and the military in Washington. The measure does not bar the possession of the weapons by people who already have them. The law would go into effect immediately once it's signed by Democratic Governor Jay Inslee, who has long advocated for such a ban. When the bill passed the State House in March, Inslee said he's believed it since 1994. When, as a member of the U.S. Congress, he voted to make the ban a federal law. Well, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to A Cup of Health with CDC, a weekly feature of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I'm your host, Dr. Kathleen Dooling. Occasional aches and pains are an expected part of life, but for many people, pain is a constant companion. Dr. Chad Helmick is with CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. He's joining us today to discuss ways to manage chronic pain. Welcome to the show, Chad. Thank you. Chad, how many people in the U.S. suffer from chronic pain? In 2016, 50 million adults had chronic pain, which is pain on most or every day in the past six months. More interesting, though, is that 20 million people have high-impact chronic pain, which is chronic pain that also limits their work or life activities on most or every day in the past six months. This is a problem because chronic pain is associated not only with symptoms, but with anxiety and depression, reduced quality of life, and the risk of opioid problems. What are the most common causes of chronic pain? The most common causes generally relate to bones and joints, like low back pain and arthritis, but there are many other causes, headaches, sickle cell disease, fibromyalgia, surgery and injuries, and many, many others. Is chronic pain more common in any particular group of people? Yes, it's, uh, it occurs at all ages, but it's more common in um, older middle-aged adults and in the oldest old, 85 and older. It's also more common in women, poor people, and those who live in rural areas. How is chronic pain treated? Well, the first thing to do is to get a diagnosis, which can help guide treatment. But the thinking about chronic pain now is it becomes a chronic disease by itself, regardless of the cause, and that can cause significant problems. The real goal in management is to have a manageable level of pain, not to get rid of all pain. There are several steps that can be taken, and these are sometimes difficult to do because of barriers to access. But it makes sense to do the simplest and safest things first. And these are non-drug steps, things like physical activity. Walking is perfectly good to help reduce pain. Also, self-management education can give you some confidence in managing chronic pain when you're on your own. There's also physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychological therapy, better sleep, which usually means less alcohol, and seeing a chiropractor or getting biofeedback and massage. If that's not enough, non-opioid drugs like Tylenol or Motrin and Advil or Naproxen or Aleve can help. 
If those don't work, then it's time to consider something stronger. Sometimes that's opioids, but there's not great evidence that opioids are good for long-term pain in most people. Do you have any advice for people suffering from chronic pain? Well, it's important to work with a variety of providers who are working together to help you. Uh, The goal, again, is manageable pain so you can live a productive life. This can include physical therapy, and most people can walk, to treat any underlying depression or anxiety, and to avoid further injuries. Finally, the National Pain Strategy is laying out a strategic roadmap to improve pain management system in this country. Where can listeners get more information about managing chronic pain? Listeners can go to the NIH website, nih.gov, and type in National Pain Strategy. Thanks, Chad. I've been talking today with Dr. Chad Helmick about ways to manage chronic pain. If you're experiencing daily pain, talk with your healthcare provider to ensure you have the correct diagnosis and know how to manage your condition. Until next time, be well. This is Dr. Kathleen Dooling for A Cup of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. It doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. Netrootsradio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. These days, America's top economic officials tend to speak in intelligible bureaucratic gobbledygook. But once upon a time, there was a plain-spoken White House economist, and he even had a sense of humor. He didn't last. Alfred Kahn was chastised by the White House in 1978 for speaking clearly and honestly about the looming possibility of a depression. Too blunt, use softer words. So Kahn started calling the downturn a looming banana. When banana industry lobbyists complained, he switched to kumquat. In that spirit, let me warn you about an unemployment taco that the autocratic Federal Reserve System is cooking up for working families. The Fed, as it's called by jolly bankers who run it, say it's imposing, quote, the restoration between supply and demand in the labor market. They soothingly add that there will very likely be some softening in the labor market conditions. You can almost hear them humming rockabye baby. But don't nod off, as Bryce Covert, the insightful economic digger and truth-teller, recently explained, there's nothing soft about the Fed's arbitrary policy. It means fewer raises and more people out of work, which means about one and a half million people will lose their jobs. She documents that, historically, such a jolt of unemployment will probably, get ready for scary words, trigger a recession. Or a taco, if that makes you feel better. The mumbo-jumbo of economists aside, what we have here is the same old power play of moneyed elites putting the jobs and wages of working families on the chopping block to jack up the exorbitant profits of monopolistic corporations. When the Fed bankers say they're restoring balance, they mean restoring the power of corporate bosses to rule unilaterally over America's workaday majority. This is Jim Hightower saying, in plain language, this is blatant class war by the privileged few against the many. Howdy ho, folks, and thanks for tuning in to my Hightower radio commentaries. And guess what? There's even more Hightower waiting for you online. Subscribers to my Substack newsletter, Jim Hightower's Lowdown, get commentaries, articles, interviews with progressive sparklies, live events, historical nuggets, and more. Go to jimhightower.substack.com to sign up, and you'll get more. That's jimhightower.substack.com. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two.
On this day in labor history, the year was 1853. That was the day that Harriet Tubman led her first trip on the Underground Railroad, the clandestine network that helped enslave people escape slavery and move north to freedom. One of the most remembered conductors on the railroad, Tubman herself escaped slavery in eastern Maryland. Tubman had been forced to work in the fields, performing back-breaking labor under a brutal overseer. As a girl, Tubman was injured when she was hit in the head by a weight thrown by an overseer. The injury plagued her with headaches and visions that Tubman attributed as signs from God. To escape these harsh conditions, Tubman had to leave her family behind. But she did not forget them. On her first trip to free those enslaved, the group included her sister and two children. On subsequent trips, she helped lead her brother and aged parents to freedom. In all, Tubman made 19 trips back to the South. She became known as Moses, leading her people out of bondage. These journeys came at a personal risk for Tubman. Enraged Southerners placed a $40,000 bounty on her head. But Tubman was known to say that she never lost a single passenger. The Civil War did not stop Tubman's bravery. She worked as a cook, a nurse, and even a spy for the Union Army. The renowned abolitionist Frederick Douglass wrote a letter for Tubman where he wrote, quote, the midnight sky and the silent stars have been the witnesses of your devotion to freedom and of your heroism. The horrors of the slave labor system ended in the United States because of the courage of those like Harriet Tubman who risked their lives to stand up against injustice. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 35 degrees Fahrenheit with cloudy conditions. We'll have overcast with showers at times throughout the day, winds light and variable, and looks like we're going to get about a quarter inch of rain between today and tonight because we will have rain showers this evening and with overcast skies overnight with more rain lows in the mid 40s winds light and variable and then cloudy skies tomorrow with highs near 65 i like that winds light and variable Grass pollen is rated as moderate here in the little town of Rogue River in southern Oregon. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 24 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is high at level 7. And you know what to do. Slather on that lotion. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.42 inches. Visibility is up to 9 miles and relative humidity is at 98%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 60 degrees and partly cloudy. Paris is 52 degrees and mostly cloudy. Rome is 67 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 52 and cloudy. Kabul is 53 degrees and clear. Hong Kong is 76 with a light rain shower. Tokyo is 68 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 60 degrees and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 50 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is 55 degrees Fahrenheit and partly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources 
from around the world. Maddie Burakoff of the Associated Press brings us this first tamuz bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Last year, sea urchins in the Caribbean started getting sick, shedding their spines, dying off, and throwing reef ecosystems into chaos. Now scientists think they've caught the killer in this marine murder mystery. A tiny single-cell parasite is to blame for the massive die-off, researchers reported yesterday Wednesday in the journal Science Advances. The case is closed, said study author Maya Breitbart, a marine microbiologist at the University of South Florida. The long-spined sea urchins, or the diadoma, Dema antelarum are prickly black creatures that hide out in reefs across the Caribbean. They play a key role as lawnmowers of the reef, Breitbart said, eating up the algae that grows on corals. But in June of 2022, the animals started showing strange symptoms, their sharp spines drooping and falling off, their suction cup feet losing their grip before dying off in droves from the Virgin Islands to Puerto Rico to Florida. For marine scientists, it was deja vu. Another die-off swept through the region in the 80s and slashed sea urchin populations by about 98%. That case was never solved. But this time, an international team of researchers jumped into action, taking samples from sick sea urchins and healthy ones as well across the Caribbean to look for genetic clues. They did not see signs of viruses or bacteria, said study author Ian Hewson, who researches marine d- diseases at Cornell. But they did spot traces of tiny single-celled organisms called ciliates, which only showed up in the sick urchins. Though most ciliates don't cause disease, this kind has been linked with other aquatic outbreaks, making it a prime suspect. To confirm they'd caught the killer, scientists placed the parasites in tanks with healthy urchins grown in captivity to see how they'd react. Out of 10 urchins who were pitted against the tiny creatures, 60% of them died after showing the same symptoms researchers were seeing in the wild. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Jerry Tanner of the AP brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Russia is suspected of spying in the waters of the Baltic Sea and the North Sea using civilian fishing trawlers, cargo ships, and yachts. The public broadcasters of four Nordic countries said in a joint investigation published yesterday, Wednesday. The investigation by the public broadcasting companies of Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden uncovered Moscow's undersea intelligence operations by tracking the radio traffic and locations of Russian vessels traveling in the seas over the past year. Analyzing the data revealed suspicious sailing patterns, particularly around offshore wind farms, gas pipelines, and undersea power and data cables, the broadcasters said. 
One of their conclusions states that Russian military and civilian ships were constantly on the move in the Baltic and North Seas with the aim of mapping critical infrastructure on the seabed. Among the reasons Moscow might be interested in doing that would be to plan and prepare possible acts of sabotage, such as cutting the flow of electricity to nearby countries. Asked to comment on the Nordic allegations that Russia was preparing to sabotage energy infrastructure, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said during a conference call with reporters that European countries again prefer to baselessly blame Russia for everything. Swedish news agency TT quoted Prime Minister Ulf Kristersson as saying he wasn't surprised by the revelation of Russia's illegitimate information gathering. But this is serious. It underlines that we have a very risky situation in our immediate vicinity, he said. In Brussels, NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg told reporters he would not speculate about the specific incidents, ships, or capabilities presented in the Nordic investigation. NATO has addressed threats against undersea infrastructure for many, many years, Stoltenberg said. After the explosions incapacitated the Nord Stream gas pipelines, we stepped up our presence in the Baltic Sea and the North Sea with ships, planes, and other capabilities, he said. That brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver